Okay, so today we're going to look at the hindrances and we're going to uh, investigate the fourth chapter in The Art of Disappearing. And uh, I like Ajahn Brahm's title, Medicines for the Mind, because when we run up into when we run into obstacles for meditation, that's what we need. We need the the right medicine to help the mind. And of course, you know, the standard five hindrances. Do you want to tell me what they are? Anybody? Um, which one? What one of them? One of them. Sensual desire. Sensual desire is one. Aversion. Aversion or ill will is another. Sloth and torpor. Yeah, sloth and torpor. <laughs> that's right. And doubt. Worry and restlessness and doubt. And that's, we got them all. That's it. <laughs> And then, and then the first thing Ajahn Brahm talks about is boredom, <laughs> which is not really uh, of the standard set, but a common problem. And this book is a collection of talks that he's given. Uh, he didn't sit down and write it. And you can tell that he's talking to meditators who have come probably to Jhana Grove, but maybe somewhere else to uh, sit at a, a retreat for some period. And so sometimes those are pretty long retreats. When I was there last uh, summer for the Vasa, there were people who were actually staying the whole three months. Mm -hmm. And there were other people who would come for a month and you know just different time. But the actual retreat container might be 10 days or it might be longer. And so in these in these uh, chapters, we'll see references to that. And he's talking at the beginning about boredom. I don't know if you you dealt with boredom in your practice. Not so much. Yes, some people have. Um, yeah, it's it's you know one of those things that um, can happen as a result of you know maybe having a lot of stimulation otherwise and then suddenly you're going to settle down and go into retreat mode and or you're living he was tight and here he talks about living in a monastery where you don't have very much going on or he as he said when he was a, a monk with Ajahn Chah it seemed like they had so much going on you know these group meetings for morning and evening and work during the day and all different kinds of things and then he would think well why do we have to have all these meetings i would just like to be in a place where you just you just can meditate and then he said of course if you get into a place like that then you get bored <laughs> and you're thinking oh couldn't there be a few you know meetings together and do some chanting together or something <clears throat> which is kind of how the mind works you know it's it tends to want something else but his his point uh, in the middle of the page 38 says, when you look at boredom, you see that it's a reaction to re relative levels of busyness. It arises because of the difference between your previous level of activity and what you're facing now. And I know that that's, that's also something we'll see with restlessness. You know, so often it's because we have a lot of stimulation and we try to get quiet and the mind just, it, it can't settle down right away. So <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, restlessness and anxiety are kind of mixed up for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how important it is to call it by the right thing, but, mm -hmm. but I get that kind of, they're mixed up for me. It could be the reason that restlessness and worry are, are stuck together. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's that active part like the over energized mm -hmm. part and then the sloth and torpor is the flip side where things get really slow and dull yeah so what Ajahn, Ajahn Brahms of hello uh, Ajahn Brahms approach here is that you know it needs time to settle down um, he said, after a while, you start to wake up to the interesting aspects of the 
the solitude or the calm um, lifestyle or situation and you start to see the joy and delight in it. And I think that that makes sense. You know, sometimes when I go on retreat, I just sleep as much as I want for the first couple of days because you're just probably exhausted for one reason or another from your normal life. <laughs> and then uh, and then if they're whatever the mental states are, eventually they start to settle. If you can just observe them, and we'll see that. in. we're also going to be looking at Ajahn Chah's teachings in that are um, presented in stillness flowing and so we'll see that that was his approach you know just observe it observe it and I'll, it'll start to adjust he said so the first strategy when you're bored is to be patient with the boredom just leave it alone just observe it don't try to fill that hole of boredom with activity because then you just perpetuate the, you know, the kind of, you kind of um, eventually have to face the, the shift in the mind anyway, if that makes any sense, the going from activity to stillness. And if you put it off, you still have to maybe deal with it later. Um, and he also talks about, um, it uses this metaphor of going into a dark room. And if you go from a bright place into a dark room, then it takes a while before you can see the, the, what's in there. And it's kind of the same way when we go from activity to being settled in meditation. It takes a while before we can see the, the pleasant, um, the uh, delightful aspects of it. And, uh, what's really there. We become more sensitive and then we can feel the different changes. Is that chair going to be okay for you, Mariah? Would you rather sit over here? I think this is this right, please. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so. Um, this idea of having patience is so important with all of the hindrances that we realize what what's happening and we don't get too concerned about it a lot of times we can make ourselves feel worse by saying oh i you know i don't want it to be this way i wish i didn't have this feeling i don't want this mental state um, it should be different than this why am i falling asleep why am i so you know so to really just start to observe and have patience with it. One of the, I'm just gonna do pull a little part here from Stillness Flowing at the beginning of this section called Thorns and Prickles. It starts on page 336, um, which is you know about the hindrances, and he says. Um, Is, uh, Ajahn Jayasaro writes about how the Buddha talked about this. He said that, uh, you know, the Buddha compared the hindrances to the baser metals impairing the purity of gold. And this is from the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, number in the Book of Fives, number 23. Once the gold has been freed from impurities, then it becomes pliant and wieldy and can be wrought into whatever ornaments one wishes. Similarly, the mind freed from the five hindrances will be pliant and wieldy, will have radiant lucidity and firmness, and will concentrate well upon the eradication of the taints or the defilements. To whatever state realizable by the higher mental faculties, one may direct the mind. One will, in each case, acquire the capacity of realization if the other conditions are fulfilled. So, you know, when you... When you, you you know when the hindrances are dissolved, you might say, or purified away, then there's this um, opportunity for awakening. And he said, when when Ajahn Chah taught about the hindrances. Um, 
He said, the one, one thing that's important is to remember that it's going to change. So this is a quote of Ajahn Chah. When something arises in your mind, no matter if it's something you like or something you dislike, something you think is right or something you think is wrong, cut it right off by reminding yourself it's changeful. It doesn't matter what it is, just chop right through it. Changeful, changeful, use this single ax to chop through mental states. Everything is subject to change. Where can you find anything real and solid? If you see this instability, then the value of everything decreases. So you don't get as caught up in whatever the mental state is. Mental states are, he said, mental states are all worthless. <laughs> Why would you want things of no value? And then um, Ajahn Jayasaro puts in, for those struggling with hindrances and feeling discouraged at their lack of success, Ajahn Chah gave the following encouragement. Even if your mind finds no peace, merely sitting cross-legged and putting forth effort is already a fine thing. This is the truth. You could compare it to being hungry and having nothing to eat except plain rice. You've got nothing to eat with the rice, and you feel upset. What I'm saying is it's good that you've got the rice to eat. Plain rice is better than nothing at all, isn't it? If plain rice is all you've got, then you eat it up. Practice is the same way. Even if you experience only a very small amount of calm, it's still a good thing. So Lung Pa Cha advised looking on all of the hindrances as teachers or tests of wisdom rather than enemies. Just, you know, like how, what's our attitude going to be when we have a certain mental state arise and it's something that we don't like, don't want. So I'm going to go back here to Ajahn Brahm. So he talks about restlessness. And he says, you sit down and you don't want to sit still, the body's uncomfortable or the mind just won't stay with the breath or any other meditation object you're trying to focus on. He says, this happens when you use too much force. So what I wanna notice here is even though Ajahn Brahm, of course, was trained by Ajahn Chah, he's, that's, he's been a monk for, I don't know, is it 50 years already? Yeah, I'm 40 something. I think he's, you know, and so it's been a long time yeah. since. Yeah. And Ajahn Brahm style has become more and more um, accepting, full of kindness, a lot less of this chop it off, <laughs> you know, use that axe and chop it off. You know, it's a lot more of, you know, be patient. Um, you know, like he says here, you know, it, some things get worse when you use force. And we're going to see that theme through this chapter. But then you don't just let it go either. You know, you don't just like there's this. Well, we'll see. We'll try. We'll, we'll look at what what we actually can do that's helpful. So he says. Sometimes the best thing to do is to just be patient and wait, sometimes, to allow the restlessness to be rather than to try to control it. And he talks about this example. How many of you have had a chance to read this chapter? What was the question? Did you read the, Did you have a chance to read the chapter? Yeah, most people did. I don't know about online, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, I'm sure you read the story of the farmer with the ox, with the water buffalo that gets away from him and hit, and the rope mm -hmm. is wrapped around his finger mm -hmm. and it pulls his finger off. And, um, you know, I mean, Ajahn Brahm's like you know, the thinking that the farmer didn't know how to deal with the water buffalo, that the water buffalo should just, you should just let go of them because they're going to stop eventually. And then you can collect them and take them where you want to go. They're not going to want to go that far. But having been on the farm and worked with animals, uh, sometimes, uh, like I remember my father saying, don't wrap 
any rope around your hand or around, you know, because if this horse gets away from you, <laughs> it's going to be, you know, really bad. So, but sometimes things happen and you, you don't mean for it to be <laughs> caught, your finger to be caught in the rope. But anyhow, Ajahn Brahm's using the story to illustrate that it might be better to let the mind go than to try to hold it back or to try to keep bringing it back to the breath. And, you know, sometimes people, that's it, meditation instruction, you know, you focus on the meditation object. If the mind goes away, then you bring it back, and you bring it back, and you bring it back. And sometimes it can mean a lot of stress and control, trying to control. So Ajahn Brahm is trying to say, well, that doesn't help. <laughs> says, don't try to hold it back. Your job is to just be mindful and at peace. And watch where the silly old mind wants to go. Your job is not to stop the mind, but to watch it, understand it, and be kind and gentle with it. Okay, so have you had any experience with this? Yes, Mariah? Um, Mariah, I'm going to really condense this, but Mariah um, has been listening to Ajahn Chah. So regardless of whether there's chopping involved, um, the meta is absolutely essential for the letting go. That's what I heard. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I know it's like um, when we really take on, and I, I know that Ajahn Brahm refers to it here, that intention, the way he puts it, of kindness, gentleness, and letting go. If we really make that the context within which we practice, there's a lot more ease, I think, and tendency towards patience with whatever's arising. However, there's a trick to it. Um, I'm not sure if it's, oh yes, middle of page 41. Forcing the mind is wrong, but so is indulgence. So the trick is that it's not going to be just letting the mind do whatever. Both force and indulgence actually feed the water buffalo mind, the mind that wants to stray away and run around or whatever. By indulgence, I mean turning your mind toward sensuality, thinking about sex or the future or movies or music or whatever else you think about when you're restless. If you keep on leaning in that direction, of course, the mind will keep going that way. But if you stand back with equanimity. So now this is introducing a bit something else, right? It's not just the kindness, um, the gentleness or the patience. It's equanimity, which is a wisdom factor. You know, you're really, you're really evaluating like, what's the mind doing and you're choosing to not encourage it or not follow it. Um, in the direction of this kind of sensual desire or other things that contribute to restlessness. If you let go, if you're kind and gentle, the water buffalo mind soon stops. Dealing with restlessness doesn't need to be a battle. If it becomes a battle, perhaps getting even worse, it's because you're feeding it with negativity, guilt, or indulgence. So those are those are important. Like, am I, is, is there negativity arising? Guilt here, I'm not sure if he means, I mean, obviously, if like restlessness and worry, or sometimes it's uh, translated as remorse or regret, like Mariah was saying, you know, sometimes that's an element of thinking about the past and wishing we had done something else or beating ourselves up one way or another. And we don't want to do that. We don't want, that's another kind of indulgence if we let that kind of thought process run. So what do we do instead? I think acknowledging how we feel, maybe working with that feeling in the body, being present with this experience, being patient, but also wise. And equanimous, like I said, equanimity has a wisdom aspect to it. it. Says you're not really facing it in the proper way. Instead of just allowing the old comma to ripen, 
you're making new bad karma. So if we follow it, if we indulge in it, we're making, you know, we're setting it up for it happening again in the future. So it's like in practicality, how do we do this? A thought arises in the mind, usually attended by a feeling. Maybe it's something from the past, or maybe it's some idea of wanting something to be different than it is. And then when we recognize that to actually see, okay, this is a mental state or um, a topic I don't want to follow. Then how do we how do we do it? Well, we have we shift or strengthen our position of mindfulness. Like when we start to see that distinction in the mind of this is the part that's watching, this is the knowing, this is the part, this is what I'm watching, and you've got that very clear. And a lot of times it's easy to forget to do that, even if we're seasoned meditators. Is you know, depending on the subject matter, we can get caught up in it. If we're caught up in it, we're indulging it. If we follow it, but but how do you make that not become a struggle or a tug of war? Well, it's it's by grounding ourselves in that observer's space, and you can observe with kindness, without judgment, without I mean, sorry, without negativity, with discernment, but without the negativity. And that's the place from which we can watch it fizzle out. It'll fizzle out on its own. I like this paragraph at the end of page 40. Uh -huh. um, so please feel, don't feel guilty if your mind is restless. Uh -huh. That one. Yeah. What's happening is not yours. It's not a me. It's And it's not a problem. This is perfect. Thank you. It's just the nature of things arising according to comic causes from the past. Hmm? I was just with how everything oh, yeah. was just tripping. You can't go into the past and cancel out those causes. You're stuck with their results right now. But if the mind wants to run off, the only thing to do is to remember the sama sankapa. So that's it, the right intention. Just let go, let it go and be kind and gentle with it. And I feel like that really works. Yeah, Elizabeth and, and Stephen and I were at a day long at Spirit Rock. Um, Let's see if we can get people to hear week, you. Was it last week, Elizabeth? <laughs> and, um, it was a, a day long at Karuma, Spirit Rock. Karuma Dama? Yeah. The monk? Okay. Yeah. Karuma Dama. Yeah. Oh, Ajahn Karuna Dhamma. Yes. And he talked a lot about karma. Mm -hmm. And uh, that paragraph right there seems to be a lot of, of, of what I got out of that day long. Mm -hmm. Because he talked about not being able to do anything about the past karma. And just like it says here about the results. But also that my response is what is creating the future. The new karma. The exactly. New karma. Exactly. So it's... So it becomes my response. Yeah. And that's that's kind of how I'm looking at the hindrances. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So what is it that we do when the hindrance when a hindrance arises that causes sets up the conditions for that hindrance to arise again in the future? And what can we do to change the pattern? And I think it really is in this, you know. Wisdom, discernment, mindfulness, letting go, equanimity. There's so then Ajahn Brahm goes into this idea of being a passive obser passive observer. So when you disengage from things, so you're you're watching. When it does this, when when you disengage from things so that all you do is watch your mind. When it does this or thinks that, it's as if you're standing back and watching it from a distance. And then he uses the metaphor of a movie. You know, if you really get wrapped up in the movie, then you're going along with it. But if you like, oh, it's just a movie, you know, you can step back and observe it as it goes along. As long as you stand back and remember that these things 
that these are just causes and conditions rolling on, not me, not mine, not self, nothing to do with me, then you won't get involved. You can watch restlessness or boredom or whatever else with a feeling of disengagement. You're just knowing and, quote, the knower is coming into focus. You use this idea of the knower, not mistaking it for a permanent self, as a stepping stone to peace. Imagine yourself sitting inside yourself. Do you know what he's talking about? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that way, whatever is happening, we have a certain level of stability and peace inside. Yeah, Elizabeth? I have a sort of a different approach to that. Like, so one of the things Ajahn Kurodamo was basically talking about not self a lot. Uh -huh. And lately, just saying the word, just noticing this is the mind and this is the mind objects. And so the knowing it's not even a self and another self, it's just the mind. Yeah. I just take all the self out, you know, mm -hmm. I don't take it out. It's gone because it's just the mind and the mind objects. Yeah. It's there's no person at person in involved at all. Yeah. And when you think about it, it's all there because of past conditioning. Then it's so much easier to not identify with it and get drawn into it. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to tiredness and energy. Or I'm gonna skip over here in the Ajahn Cha part. To sloth and torpor. And again, there's a there's a very there's a different approach here um, between Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Brahm at this point. Um, Ajahn Brahm, at the very beginning, he says, "Please remember not to fight the tiredness." Mm -hmm. I say that from bitter experience. I was encouraged to do that, and I found it completely counterproductive. Every time you fight tiredness, you just get tense since fighting leads you in the opposite direction of gentleness, kindness, and letting go, it's actually a subtle form of ill will. I know I've certainly experienced that. Um, and Ajahn Chah, you know, he's more from the place of, well, if you find yourself sleepy every day, try to eat less. Examine yourself as soon as the five, five more spoonfuls, et cetera, and take, take less, eat water, I mean, drink water, you must learn to balance your eating. It's one, one approach. Other approaches, if you're sitting in the dark, move to a lighted place, open your eyes, get up or wash your face or take a shower. If you sleep or sleepy, change postures, walk a lot, walk backwards. The fear of running into things will keep you awake. If this fails, stand still, clear the mind, imagine it's, a, it's full daylight or sit on the edge of a high cliff or a deep well. You don't dare sleep. If nothing works, then just go to sleep. Lay down carefully and try to be aware until the moment you fall asleep. Then as you awaken, get up right away. Don't look at the clock or roll over. Start practicing mindfulness from the moment you wake up. So it's a different, you know, different attitude. Um, Ajahn Brahm, um, said some meditators feel embarrassed or guilty when they're tired. We feel humiliated by the fact that we've been meditating for many years and still can't keep a straight back early in the morning. But guilt just adds to the sense of ego and self and we start to own these problems. Be careful not to own your sleepiness. It has nothing to do with you. It's just an effect stemming from a cause. If you get sleepy, just stay with it. Watch it be kind and gentle, investigate it. What does it feel like? How long does it last? Or more, most importantly, what causes it? What sorts of things make it fade away? After it fades away, what's left? So this is a really skillful way to investigate, I think. What is the cause of sleepiness? I think it gets to this, but a lot of times the cause of sleepiness is unhappiness. 
Like we don't really, there's something going on that's unexamined and we don't really look at it or we can't maybe in the situation we're in really look at it. And that causes the mind to just want to shut down. Well, wouldn't, but wouldn't um, age or illness also come into play? Definitely age and illness come into play. I mean, now um, at my age, Sometimes I just have the feeling like, okay, I have to lie down. It may not take long, you know, 10, 20 minutes. And then I get up and I can meditate with a bright alert mind. But if I'm in, and so instead of fighting it, I just start to really learn about my body and my mind. You know, it's like there are times when it's just not ready to meditate. It needs other kinds of support. Maybe it does. Maybe my body does need something to eat. At this stage in my life, given the fact that I can lose weight easily and it's not so easy to gain it again, um, missing meals and adjusting my eating is not the right approach. And one of the things to know is like Ajahn Chah is teaching a bunch of young men <laughs> who are probably trying to like eat as much as they possibly can in a very short amount of time. And, you know, just like, you know, it's it, we have to really learn about our situation and our bodies and they change. And really see what are the causes. I like this, this exploration. You know, what does this tiredness and, and maybe sort of dullness feel like? How long does it last? What causes it? What sorts of things make it fade away? After it fades away, what's left? I mean, these are really interesting questions. And it's, it's, so it's, again, not just uh, trying to wake up and force yourself to come back to your meditation object, but to really see, okay, what's happening? Why does this happen at this time of day? Or is this something else that I can do to get myself ready for meditation? Did you want to say, somebody over here want to say something? I have a problem, um, like, when I have meditating in the early morning, um, I notice I tend to really plan a lot. I notice that, but I try to watch my mind, mm -hmm. but my mind keep going back the planning part. Yeah. And I tried many times still going back. But if I meditate, for example, midday, even afternoon, I could stand back, be a passive observer. Mm -hmm. I just wondering, is that because, um, is there anything I can do? Because in the morning is the best time to meditate, no distraction. It's understandable, probably because you've got the day ahead of you and there are probably a number of things you need to do, that kind of thing. So the mind starts to get going on that. And I think one one technique that I use sometimes, if if I you know, I really want to meditate at that time, even though the mind clearly wants to do something else, uh, is to give it a stronger meditation object, like chanting, or, um, you know, some kind of guided meditation, whether you're guiding your own mind or you're listening, because then you have the time to calm the body mind uh, you know, kind of bringing in those resources before you go into your day, it still may have that effect. But it's not trying to, you know, fight with the mind to get it to stop. So, the, like you said, those sessions later in the day are probably more conducive to being able to still the mind. But if you can, you know, sometimes walking meditation helps and using a mantra. But those are the kinds of things that kind of give a stronger container, you might say, more, more um, defined container for the mind and draw its attention away from its concerns. Thank you. Allison? Uh, I, I also have problems with looking forward and planning. And um, if I can't just settle down, I remind myself that this is the time I've set aside to meditate. 
And that's really what I want to do in this moment. I try to do it very gently and kindly. Yeah. And usually that will help me just say, yeah, I'll think about that later. Yeah. I don't have to think about that now. And um, mm -hmm. I have plenty of time to think about it later. Okay. So that really helps me yeah. enjoy the meditation as long as I'm gentle. Yeah. Me, which I usually am. I, I know how to do it. This is a very good point because um, if, in case you couldn't hear Allison, she uses this uh, way of, of really informing the mind, talking to the mind, reminding to have a very strong intention that this is for, you know, that this space is for meditation, letting the mind know that the planning can be done later. There's going to be plenty of time for that later. I don't know if that's your situation. Like, you know, there may not be plenty of time later, but if, you know, if we set, I notice this for myself, if I set a, a sort of definite, clear intention at the beginning of meditation, I have a much better chance of going in that direction. And so that might be enough. And Allison was pointing out that it, she's learned how to do it with a kind of, it sounds like a gentleness, but also firmness. So that, that it's very clear what she wants the mind to do. And Ajahn Brahm talks about this kind of thing, you know, really coaching the mindfulness before you start. Like this is this is what we're doing. And the mindfulness has the instructions, as we talked about last month, I think. Giving the mindfulness the instructions that it needs in order to make the decisions it needs to make about what to follow and what to let go of. And so this is this is kind of what you're saying, and that seems to work in dealing with planning. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I just have to add, because I saw her like shaking her head like she doesn't have time afterwards to plan. I try to plan my next day the night before. Oh. And and I write a little list of things and the time I'm going to do them. And that helps me in the morning. Yeah, planning. She was talking about planning the next day, the night before, writing the list so that you already kind of get a head start on the planning. So that's another possibility if there's time the night before to, to do it. So the um, suggestion here is uh, actually coming from uh, one of the abbots at Forest Temple Forest Monastery. It's like the mind wants to plan, so he gives it a few minutes. You can plan during this particular stage and then um, maybe write something down, a little list or not or just commit it to memory. Um, depending on the mind, you might be able to commit it to memory or not, but writing it down. And then when the mind knows it has this amount of time, again, the kindness of uh, working with the mind instead of working against the mind can help. Yeah, I, I sometimes just remind myself, this is your chance to practice. Yeah, <laughs> I do that too. This is our chance. <laughs> you know, let's go in and let's, and I, some, the other thing I say sometimes to, to myself, and I also might say it when I'm leading meditation is, this is the most important time of the day. This is the most important activity we're going to do today. And if we really understand that, if we believe that, um, it can really help the mind focus yeah well i think that um i think when he, when he refers to patience here mm -hmm. um that is what has helped me the most because when my mind goes into that planning um for me that's a story mm. um so, so it's a, the planning turns out to be more like a story and kind of a distraction and if you really have patience it's patience with through mindfulness, right? So the mindfulness is there, having some patience with the mind, but you're just observing. You're not really adding to it. You're not encouraging the planning. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and because um, for me, it, 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 I was naming it a story. My mm -hmm. planning became mm -hmm. a story. And when I, um, when I let it run, it eventually stops. Mm -hmm. And it eventually became less and less. Mm -hmm. So letting it run. So um, that's interesting, right? Like, what does it mean to let it run without indulgence, without fueling it? And that's something that we all have to 
practice with to learn the difference there. What are the thoughts that are like that throwing the dry wood onto the fire, making it go hotter <laughs> or keep going? And what are the thoughts or what is the attitude of the mind that helps it to just run out of steam on its own? Because that's what you're talking about. Yeah. It runs out of steam on its own. Yeah. I mean, that has helped me. And and, and eventually, um, it's it's minimum. Mm -hmm. Minimal. Uh, yeah. Uh, as a result of doing that. So for me, I think it really depends on the, the situation. If there's something I'm planning because... You know, maybe there is a meeting in the afternoon that I need to lead or something. And then the mind just keeps wanting to go back to that until it feels satisfied, until it feels prepared. In that case, it usually is helpful for me to let it do that. But if it's something that's more driven by anxiety or stress or worry or something like that, then it's like if I indulge it, it doesn't bring about the the patient the the stillness the calm Ajahn uh, Punadamo says for example like with restlessness he said never get up from your meditation because you're restless you never you never conquer it that way so being patient is patience to stay present with it and really observe the mind's thinking. That never part. <laughs> I don't find that helpful. Okay. Thank you for that. I did. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true. I tend to stick with something to see it through. Mm -hmm. But there are times when I, it's fruitless. Yeah. It's time to get up and put it down. And and I don't do it too often because that's not a habit, you know, yeah, that I'm yeah. trying. But that so sounds... I think it's very, you have to be very discerning when to let it run, when to cut it off. And the only way to do that is to spend enough time with it so that the discernment, the wisdom arises. And you say, well, I'm going to give this a few more minutes and then maybe things do come, calm down. Mm -hmm. But there are times when it's, uh, it's you, yeah. you know. I, and then it's for me, like I was saying about the tiredness. Yeah. Sometimes getting up is the right thing that's interesting and i think it's true for me too mm -hmm. yeah. because it's a changing thing the yeah. mind the body the it's all changing and i mean there are certain trends and patterns you know you can see maybe you drop things too quickly or maybe you stay with them too but you have to be attuned yeah yeah i found that um once i started actually um, giving myself time to rest, time to sit still, sit still and be quiet, not in meditation, mm -hmm. um, time to nap, um, just to like make more space for myself so that it wasn't that, that block in the morning and that block in the evening when I meditated was the only time I was not doing something, you know, and then it really has improved the quality of the meditation time because the body, you know, does need the rest. Um, like you were saying, sometimes you do need to lie down for 10 or 20 minutes. But that whole idea of um, sitting still, being quiet um, has taught me how to not have a goal in meditation yes it's just separated the goal out yeah and it's interesting to compare or discern between intention and goal mm -hmm. intention is and this i'll give it make a stab at it and you can all t tell me what you think or if you have a different way of thinking about this but from my perspective intention is you know, this is, I'm really intending to be present here with my meditation object to allow my body and mind to become calm. Uh, I'm really going to stay, stay present with this. 
that kind of thing is an intention. A goal can be very um, counterproductive because a goal oftentimes is like, I want this to happen, or I'm going to make this happen. Does that make sense? Is that distinction clear? No, uh, Analio in uh, Mindfulness of Breathing, he starts it off by saying, um, formulate your motivation. Mm. And I found that motivation is a good word because it's like, why am I even doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, and it really gets me to think about why I'm doing this as I begin to sit down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, motivation, intention, nice, nice mm -hmm. addition there, I think. Like, what is it that motivates us to meditate? You know, what's going to inspire the mind to to do this? Suffering. I was well, just thinking that. that. that Suffering. But yeah. what's the motivation that, I mean, to end the suffering? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very clear for me most okay. of the time. So when you think of the um, the point, the, the time then when Bhante Nalio was talking about this, would that fit the kind of motivation? Or what kind of motivation would you? Well, now I've just been doing it. I, sometimes I listen to the part one, part one and two. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's something that I'm starting with. And I, when I first kind of was moving back to the house, it was just, I just want to be present for my life. So I'm practicing paying attention to my breathing to help train myself so that I can be more present. But lately, I don't know what's going on, but it's like, I'm not sure. I know I'm not, I can't even like formulate a motivation. So I'm just sitting down mm -hmm. and waiting uh -huh. Uh -huh. right now. Okay. Yeah. Which is another lesson in, you know, it's so helpful that we have so much access to teachings from really good practitioners and we still need to discern whether this teaching is right for my this mind that we have right now right now right yeah everything changes yeah changes. i really i really appreciate that from the the reading maybe it was the prior reading i said i read two of them about everything changing because yeah. that concept of impermanence is very cerebral for me but for some reason when i'm sitting i just remember oh yeah it's changing it's changing and I, i'm just finding that it's easier for me to um be at ease with that and not hang on in the same way as that concept of impermanence, which is, it's, mm. it's just, I'm just finding it easier yeah. to remind myself it's changing, it's changing. Yeah. yeah. It's changing. I'm thinking about this now. That's going to change. Mm -hmm. You know, and not worry about it for the next. Yeah. Or the way that uh, Ajahn Jayasaro rendered it here is changeful. Mm -hmm. So that word that Ajahn Chao is used in Thai, my mm -hmm. And, you know, like it's all, unstable mm -hmm. and looking at those different aspects of a Nietzsche or you know this this thing is this thing changes um, whatever I think of it now <laughs> it's gonna change mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so in case you couldn't hear all of she was talking she's asking the question does it really matter what the steps are that you take to get to calm the, the mind being peaceful mm -hmm. and lucid and and um, tranquil, the body and mind, and it, mm -hmm. it's like no. And and remember, this is the medicines. So this is where the mind is it, it having problems, and we want to help it. You know, so these don't have to be steps. Mm -hmm. These are the things we bring in when the mind needs some extra support. Yeah. And it's it's true that we can have the Buddha gave so many different approaches because we need different approaches because we are conditioned in different ways and the mind has different our minds have different kind of propensities certain things are attractive to your particular mind and then that also changes over time mm -hmm. so it yeah I don't think it does matter I mean sometimes you can really be at a place in your practice in your life where you sit down and bam, you're, you're still. And then other periods of time, I think most likely because of what's going on in our life, uh, 
we may have some real challenges becoming so and to and it's okay you know we pick up these suggestions try them out you know sometimes when we're restless the best thing to do is walking meditation or even just take a walk in nature then when you come back maybe it's easier to sit and, and let the mind relax so i think you're right i don't it's not that it matters no what matters is that we can become calm and that, you know, there are those causes that the Buddha talks about that lead to samadhi, that that we set up the causes and conditions regardless of where we begin, if we have hindrances present or not, setting up those causes and conditions that allow that to arise, the joy, the happiness, the tranquility, that are vital conditions, as the Buddha said, for samadhi. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see here. Something from Ajahn Cha, maybe. On restlessness. Agitation and worry. Um, Ajahn Jayasara points out that the fourth hindrance, he calls it two kinds of mental noise. Agitation, a busy, restless mind or worry or guilt thoughts about the past. So we've talked about that. So here's a quote from Ajahn Chah. When it darts about, it's right there. You don't follow it, but you're aware of it. Where could it go? It's in a cage. It can't go anywhere. Your problem is that you don't want anything going on in your mind. Lung Parman called this vacant state tree stump samadhi. If your mind is darting around, know that it's doing that. So tree stump to samadhi, um, it sounds like this, it's, you know, it's that kind of state where you're not really mindful. You're not really present and clear. You're just kind of like vacant. If your mind is darting around, know that it's doing that. If it's motionless, know that. What more do you need? Just have the measure of both movement and stillness. If today the mind is peaceful, then see it as a foundation for wisdom. But people like that peace. It makes them happy. They say, today I had a wonderful sitting, so peaceful. There, if you think like that, then the next day it'll be hopeless. and Your mind will be a jumble. And then it's, oh, today my sitting was terrible. Unfortunately, good and bad have this. No, not unfortunately. Ultimately. Ultimately, good and bad have the same value. Good things are impermanent. Bad things are impermanent. Why give them so much significance? If the mind is agitated, then look at that. If it's peaceful, then look at that. In this way, you allow wisdom to arise. Agitation is a natural expression of the mind. Just don't get caught up with it. A monkey doesn't keep still, does it? I imagine living in Thailand or Sri Lanka where there are monkeys. I mean, have when I when we've been around monkeys, it's been pretty interesting. You know, you really get it. Okay, no way they're talking about. <laughs> Suppose you see a monkey and start to feel uncomfortable because it won't keep still. That can also happen. Um, you begin to wonder when it will ever stop moving around, and you want to make it still so that you can feel at ease. But that's the way monkeys are. A Bangkok monkey, an Ubon monkey. Monkeys are the same everywhere. It's a monkey's nature to move about, and realizing that is the end of the problem. If you're going to keep suffering all the time because the monkey doesn't keep still, you're on your way to an early grave. <laughs> You'll be even more of a monkey than a monkey is. <laughs> okay, so then Ajahn Pram talks about over now he, he comes to uh, desire and ill will right here which Ajahn Chah covered or was covered in uh, Ajahn Chah's biography earlier it's about wanting something to be different that's when you look at your dukkha it's wanting something to be different than it is that's really where it where it comes from and 
you know, you get no happiness or peace, desires pull you away from where you can find true satisfaction. So he says, just sit there. Don't move, just watch. This is Ajahn Brahm's uh, advice. He says, desire creates uh, doing and so does ill will. You want to do so, you want to like do something. Desire and ill will are what make you move and they're what make you tired. They create the activity of the mind that disturbs and agitates you. And once you see ill will and desire and how they work, you can say, no, I'm not going to get involved in that anymore. What I have is good enough. And that good enough, that is really helpful. Um, even if someone says, how are you? Good enough. <laughs> um, and he talks about good enough, poor D in Thai, says it's a beautiful mantra. It's great to use in your meditation, no matter what you're experiencing. If you're so tired that your head is almost on the floor, you say, that's good enough. <laughs> As you breathe in and out, you say, that's good enough, good enough. But if you have to be, but you have to be consistent and make every moment good enough. And this way you subdue the desire you, do, you subdue the desires that take you away and the ill will that keeps you from staying here and you get a sense of stillness and satisfaction. There's nothing you need, nothing you desire, and the here and now really is good enough. Sounds like an invitation to meditate. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Get comfortable. Get a chance to put this into action. If we take this opportunity to set an intention, what would it be? I think the one I want in my mind right now is to just relax and be aware and alert. No goals, no expectations. Just sit here and there is a kind of joy arising in my heart that I'm here with such good company. And that's, that's always a beautiful reflection. I have my spiritual friends here with me. How lucky I am. Take, take time to let the meditation object get established and you know, have our mindfulness coming up. No hurry, no worry, no need to change anything. And just Attending upon this meditation object as the mind is ready for that.
most of the time when I find myself free of hindrances, it's because my mind is on an object that I really enjoy. Maybe I'm really enjoying the breath, grateful for it, having a pleasant time observing it, feeling it in the body. And maybe I'm following a guided meditation that I really find helpful, even if it's just inside my mind. And when the mind is happy and relaxed and focused on this thing it finds quite delightful, then eventually, later when I check in, to see if there are any hindrances, they might be completely gone. Nothing to want, nothing to wish to get rid of.
So we'll bring the meditation to a close. I think online you cannot hear that bell. It's beautiful though, sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, this hasn't been what we would call a thorough investigation of the hindrances, but we get to do that as our practice. <laughs> we come up. <laughs> and um, it's good, you know, after a meditation to think about, well, what happened there? You know? So my intention to be clear and present, stay present. There were times in this little short session where my mind right away it started to get a little dull and then I could just kind of turn up the light a little bit and of course that's not always what we can do but when hindrances aren't very strong a lot of times just a little bit of added energy or support or a little bit of calming um, a little bit of you know something we want and, and setting it aside reminding ourselves that it's impermanent etc and you know, or ill will, just like, you know, sort of, okay, you don't want that, okay, let it go for now, and that's enough, you know. Um, I think it's when it's re something really strong has come up, then we need the specific medicine for that state of the mind. So noticing, yeah. So it's kind of a low part of the day for meditation, maybe, and um, being able to to brighten it up. So I don't know if you have anything that you know you'd like to share. Any questions that have come up? But we have another thirteen minutes or so of official program here. <laughs> Yes, Elizabeth. I uh, I have I'd like a comment on. So sometimes uh, in the meditation, the mind is pretty quiet, um, not sleepy, barely you know clear, but there's like nothing going on. I'm not bored. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing going on. Present and Present. no thoughts. Um, they might flip through but they're not grabbing mm -hmm. they're not too distracting right and sometimes I have the thought oh I should be doing something with this you know with this quiet I but then I think no I, but I'm just curious you know I don't it's not a waste of time yeah but it kind of feels you know it's a little strange to just I would almost say content but there's just that little nagging like so what am I supposed to be, what's supposed to be going on? Am I supposed to be um, mm -hmm. reflecting on there's something? something I should do? Yeah. You should be having an insight, of course. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I think what Ajahn Brahm would recommend, and I think I would too, is, you know, just um, seeing if your mindfulness, maybe your mindfulness become a little bit stronger. Like what meditation object or are, are you present with your meditation object at that time? No. I'm okay. Quieter. That's after mm. I the, I use the meditation object to get quiet, and then I'm quiet. Okay. <laughs> if it works. Uh huh. So I'm not on and off. I'm and not. You, and you're not wanting anything. You're not wanting to get rid of anything. It's just peaceful. Yeah. Is it a little dull or is your mind bright? In between, neither. So you might want to see if the brightening of the mind can happen a little bit, take a little more interest. In what? Your meditation object. If, if I'll it's, go back to that. Or in what you're observing. Whatever it is, whatever's happening. Whatever yeah. it is. You know, it's, it, you don't want that vacantness. Is it, you know, because yeah. calm can be kind of vacant or floating. It's a little vacant. But yeah. It's, it, but it's not like gone. Uh -huh. It's just a little vacant. <laughs> yeah, so um, being present with the body in some way or your breath, something like that, and have, taking a bit more interest because it sounds to me like the light of the mind needs to be turned up mm -hmm. a little bit. It's you want to see if there's PT. Is there sukha? No, but there's, there's content. 
It's very peaceful. Okay. No. Well, I don't know. See what happens. You feel happy with that? Um, I mean, I think, you know, we're interested in um, preparing the mind for insight to arise. And it sounds like maybe there needs to be a little more energy in the mind. So just see if, you know, um, there's a point where the process of meditation kind of takes over. Mm. And I think what you're describing feels a little stagnant. Yeah. So maybe a, a bit more energy, maybe there's some arising of a bit more joy that could come if you kind of give it that attention. Yeah. Well, that's a good. Sometimes I think that that's, you know, just be with that. Just be patient. It, there's maybe. nothing to do. Yeah. You know, maybe it's just, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Well, just kind of, kind of get that sense of whether it feels stagnant or whether it feels just really calm and open. You know, okay. like with, now, you know, like Ajahn Biak when he was talking about PT, it's like it should be every yeah, part no, of your I body. Don't, every, I don't have that. You know, <laughs> I can't say that. Does it's... PT ever arise? No. Uh -huh. No. Okay. I meant that that just that place. You know. Mm. No, no. Okay. It's stillness. Lucid? It is lucid. Okay. That's why it doesn't feel dull. Okay. But it, it might be a little vacant. Okay. <laughs> Don't know. I think I think if there's lucid calm, to me that brings about the you know, there's a brightness there, if you will, or kind mm -hmm. of a you're present and yeah, I do. aware. So maybe that's all you need and just Patiently observe what's going to happen. What you know, if anything comes about. Okay. Yes, my I'm wondering um, if I can ask about Arjun Brown. Mm -hmm. um, how old is he? Where does he live? He lives in Australia, Australia. in Western Australia, in a monastery called Bodhinyana near Perth. But it is in the forest, and uh, he's seventy. He's going anyway. to be seventy-three in August. <laughs> yeah, he's two and a half years older than me. That's it, because I was seventy in February. Um, yeah, I think that's right. So anyway, uh, I haven't I studied with him. Well, I spent the three months uh, with at his monastery last year and of course have been listening to him like many of us for a long time he has visited our place a couple of times and you know so there is a connection there he's not um one of my main teachers though i have a couple that i've really uh, taken dependence upon or um, have that more formal relationship with but as a disciple of Ajahn Chah, someone who lived with Ajahn Chah, I know quite a few of the monks who have been with Ajahn Chah. And so um, just I see the beauty of their practice. And they all have different you know, different personalities, obviously, but different um, ways of teaching. And I really enjoyed this book while I was there and in, uh, in doing a lot of meditation. So I thought maybe this group would also benefit from it. He was born in England. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he's British. It's a great book. I enjoy it a lot. Yeah, me too. Can well, trying to push them away doesn't work very well. I find one of the approaches I take is to try to have more calm before I sit to meditate. So doing things that are helpful to bring the mind and more peace to the mind. Um, now, Ajahn Suchart says that our thoughts are just defilements. And try to stop thinking. <laughs> He's like, uh, you know, the forest monks often give you this, you know, like do use a mantra through the day. You know, whenever you're doing something you don't have to think about, then use a mantra to still your mind. Um, use a lot of sense restraints so you don't have a lot of input to the mind. But, you know, you have to kind of see what you want to do and, and be patient with it. 
the, the less you, when Ajahn Brahm's advice is the less you pay attention to the thoughts and you just, or Ajahn Chah too, as we read, you know, you're, you're observing your meditation object, the thoughts come in, just let them be, don't pay attention, don't, don't own them, don't be disturbed by them, just let them pass through. Gradually, they, you know, the more we can have the mind in that calm, pleasant state, the, the more the thoughts, and, and if we're not too dis, kind of disturbed or, um, you know, too, too activated or stimulated in our ordinary life, then eventually the thoughts should calm down. And even if they don't, you know, like Ajahn Chah said, you know, don't take them seriously. It's not me. It's not mine. Just, you know, let them go. Trying different ways. Sometimes I, I bring in a stronger meditation object. If they're, if the thoughts won't calm down, I might use the Brahma Viharas or something to really um, infuse the mind with these positive mental states. In the Majjhima Nikaya, in number 19 and 20, dividing the mind, dividing thoughts into two categories. So this is very much Ajahn Brahm's teaching about um, you know, kindness, gentleness, and letting go. And those are the thoughts that you put in one category and the opposite in a different category so you know which are the wholesome and unwholesome thoughts. You feed those kindness, uh, gentleness, and letting go thoughts, and you starve the others. And, and then the removal of distracting thoughts, the Buddha gives five methods for working with thoughts that come into the mind. And so one of the approaches is to ignore them. But there are those four other approaches that you can try. They're also graduated. They are graduated. You know, you can you can replace them. You know, if if they're if they're uh, agitating thoughts, and you can replace them with the wholesome thoughts. And that's the first the first approach. So, like you know, when I bring in the Brahma Viharas instead. That's really replacing the mental state that was there. <clears throat> maybe it brings in more life. Maybe it brings in more, more fullness. I don't let a pita can arise from, you know, putting our attention on loving kindness or other part, other Brahma Viharas, and so on. It goes it goes through um, various approaches. Well, thank you for your questions and comments.